today is hard choices. And this isn't just an academic talk. I want you to be thinking about a hard choice you have in your own life and see if my research is at all useful to you in thinking about your hard choice. And if it's not, I want you to raise your hand in the Q&A and tell me why. But first, I'd like to start with three real life hard choices that were sent to me by people from around the world looking for help in thinking about their hard choices. First, there's Anna, who works at a large pharmaceutical company in the United States. She works in the R&D, the research department, basic research. She loves her work. She's doing basic science, but she's not paid very much. And so what she wants is she wants to look for another job that pays her more. And she is offered a job that pays her more, but it involves becoming a manager. If she takes the new job, she will make more money and achieve financial security, which she needs because she wants to start a family. But it means that the cost is that she can no longer uh, have the intellectual satisfaction she gets from doing basic research. Then there's Aisha, who wrote to me from India, where she lives with her husband and two small children. She tells me she's uneducated. They're very poor. The problem is that her husband beats her. And she doesn't, she, she doesn't know whether she can get up and leave. She thinks if she leaves her husband and takes her two children with her, she will not be able to provide for them because she is unskilled. So her hard choice is between abandoning her children and striking out a life of her own, as opposed to submitting herself to what looks to be a lifetime of physical and mental abuse. Finally, there's Alexander, who wrote to me from Germany, where he lives with his wife. He met his wife when they were high school sweethearts. And as he put it to me, he's never physically experienced another woman. He's now a middle-aged man. He says he desperately needs to have sex with another woman. He's very open with his wife about it. Together, they've been to couples counseling. They've gone to chat rooms online, talking to other couples with similar problems. His wife says, in no uncertain terms, if he has sex with another woman, their marriage is over. So his hard choice, as he conceives it, is between losing, and these are his words, losing a part of his soul if he doesn't have sex with another woman, or losing his soul mate if he does. So from these three stories, we can recognize the phenomenon of hard choices, which we can gloss as follows. You've got two alternatives, A and B. One is better than the other in some respects. The other is better than the other in other respects, and yet neither seems at least as good as the other overall. There's a sense in which your reasons for choosing one as opposed to the other have run out. And one way to understand what we're going to be doing today is together going on a hunt for the sense in which your reasons run out in hard choices. So more specifically, we're going to look at two questions, and we're going to try to answer both questions today. One is, why is your hard choice hard? What is it that makes a choice hard? And second, what should you do in the face of a hard choice? So under the first question, what makes a choice hard? Well, there are three common answers to this question. So if I pulled you over on the street and tried to ask you, what makes your choice hard? My guess is you'd come up with one of the following three answers. The first thing you'd say is, my choice is hard because I don't know enough. Right? The choice is complex. There are many factors I can't possibly know. If I only were omni omniscient, then the choice would be easy. So ignorance is the number one explanation of why our choices are hard. Next explanation. Your choices or the values involved in your choices are what's called incommensurable. And roughly, the idea of incommensurability is there's no single scale of units by which you can measure the value of each of your options. And that's why your choice is hard. The third explanation is your options can't be compared. 
So your choice is hard because your alternatives are incomparable. I'm going to argue that these three orthodox explanations are all mistaken and that there is a fourth explanation of why your choices are hard. But first, there's a deeper question we have to look at. Our examination of hard choices gives us a window into one of the deepest questions philosophers can ask, which is, what is it to be rational in the first place? Here's the model I promise you all grew up with, what I call the template model of rationality. And the template model is one according to which we are supposed to be like scientists going out into the world looking for the reasons we have to do things. So we're like discoverers. We have to find what reasons there are for us to do this as opposed to that. And then we have to respond to those reasons appropriately. It's as if there's a template in the sky, right? a big kind of pattern. <clears throat> Think of it as a conditional. If blank, comma, then you should do this. So if you have a child, then you must save for its education. If you punch someone in the nose, then you must apologize. The template is there given to us, and our job as rational agents is to figure out what goes in the blank and what reasons we have to do things after we figure out what goes into the blank. Our study of hard choices will give us a new way of thinking about what it is to be rational. So after we understand what hard choices are, we will see that our job as rational agents is different than we thought. OK, so now let's go back to the first question, what makes a choice hard? There are the three explanations. Let's take them in order. Start with ignorance. Hard choices are hard because we're dumb. I think that there are, there's a good reason to doubt this explanation. Suppose after this talk, you go out with some friends for dessert, and you're offered a choice between lemon sorbet and apple pie. Suppose all that matters in the choice between the two desserts is which tastes better to you. So you taste some of the lemon sorbet, and you think, ooh, that's cool and refreshing. And then you taste some of the apple pie, and you think, that's warm and comforting and sweet. Both delicious. But they taste very different. And so you conclude, you know, neither tastes better overall than the other. So now that you conclude neither tastes better than the other, is the right thing to say, oh, they taste equally good to me. Well, here's a test we can perform to see whether that's true. We improve the apple pie. We make it a little tastier, add a little whipped cream. And now you taste the apple pie with the whipped cream, and you're sure it tastes better than it does without the whipped cream. But now you taste the lemon sorbet, and you compare the taste of the lemon sorbet with the taste of the apple pie with the whipped cream. And again, you judge neither tastes better overall than the other. So it must follow that the apple pie and the sorbet don't taste equally good. And why is that? Well, because there's a little argument we can give. And just so that you don't think we're talking about trivial things like desserts here, forget about this argument. and. Go back to the hard choice I asked you to think about in your own life. And notice that of the two options, you judge that neither is better than the other. And yet, when you improve one of them a little bit, right, you make a clear but small improvement in it, it doesn't follow that the improved version of that option is now better than the other original option. And what that shows is that in a hard choice, it's not true that one option is better than the other or that they're equally good. 
So your reasons have run out, but not because of your own stupidity, but because of how the alternatives relate. So the key lesson when we think about ignorance is not that any hard choice you face is not hard because you're ignorant. Sometimes the hard choices we face are hard because we lack information. The point is rather that if we think that all of our hard choices, and crucially the most interesting ones, are hard because we lack information, we obscure what I believe is the true explanation of hard choices. Put another way, God, Buddha, whoever, any omniscient creature also faces hard choices. Okay, so we're now going to move on from ignorance and look at our second explanation of what makes a choice hard, and that is incommensurability. First question, what is it? It's a technical term of art, but it comes from, at least in the Western tradition, from the Pythagoreans. There was a Pythagorean called Hippasus of Metapontum, who one day is noodling around with a unit square, and he notices you know, the length of the side of the unit square, one, can't be put on the same scale as the length of the diagonal, which is square root of two. You can't put on the same scale, he thought, a rational number and an irrational number. And this discovery put into crisis the Pythagorean philosophy, because the Pythagoreans thought that you could represent or measure everything in terms of a ratio of integers. And here's old Hippasus who comes along and says, no, you can't. And the way the story goes is that a bunch of Pythagorean thugs take Hippasus out to sea and drown him in an attempt to keep the discovery secret. Although Hippasus was drowned, the idea of incommensurability got out. And today, when we apply it to hard choices, we have the idea of two values, right, like intellectual satisfaction and financial security, which cannot be put on a single scale of cardinal units by which you can measure the value of both. So remember Anna, who had to decide between staying in her current job and where she's getting a lot of intellectual satisfaction and moving to a new job where she will get financial security. One way to think about why her choice is hard is because there is no scale of units of, say, well-being, good life units, in terms of which we can measure the value of the new job and the value of the current job. So incommensurability, I now want to explain, is everywhere. And here's my favorite argument for why there's a lot of incommensurability around. It comes from Elizabeth Anderson at the University of Michigan. She says, if, say, the value of your child is commensurable with the value of a beach vacation, then you should be able to put the value of each on a single scale, right? usually dollars. Right. The attitudes we have towards goods should reflect their actual value. So if the value of your child is commensurable with the value of a fabulous vacation in the Maldives, then you should be thinking of your wonderful daughter as worth 19 such vacations and your troublesome son as worth only 10. But those aren't the attitudes we have towards our children. Now, incommensurability is important and it's everywhere, but it's important because it, the presumption of commensurability is built into many of our institutions. So for example, if you're in the government, be it this government, my government, any government in the world, and you have to choose between creating thousands of jobs or saving the spotted owl from distinct extinction, the way you do it is you presume that there is a scale of units by which you can measure the value of the two options. So you assume that they are commensurable. 
But as we've just seen, the truth is that the goods that our governments compare are incommensurable. And so the methods that our governments use to make decisions that affect millions of lives presuppose a false view of the value of goods. Although incommensurability is important, it's not important for us. And why is that? Because although your hard choice is probably between two options that are incommensurable, the incommensurability is not what makes the choice hard. And why is that? Because even if two things are incommensurable, it doesn't follow that you cannot compare them. One option could be better than the other, even though they're incommensurable. So here are some examples. So when you go shopping, you have a list of things you want to get. First in importance is the milk, and then the apples. There may be no cardinal scale of units, right? It's not true, perhaps, that the milk is 2.5 times more important than the apples. Nonetheless, you know that the milk ranks higher than the apple. There is a mere ordinal ranking, which doesn't presume that there is a scale of units by which you can measure the value of items. Or take some achievements or pleasures in your life. The pleasure you get from having a nice ice cream, there's no unit by which we can say that the goodness to you of having that ice cream is only 0.0497 times the goodness to you of achieving a lifetime goal. Nonetheless, it's very clear that achieving a lifetime goal is better than having the ice cream. So even though the options that in your hard choice are incommensurable, it doesn't follow that one of the options isn't better than the other. Maybe one option is better. And if that option is better, then the choice isn't hard. You should choose it. So incommensurability is not what makes your choice hard. So now we go to the third explanation of why your hard choice might be hard. And that is, you can't compare the options. But there's a reason to reject this op option. OK, so this part is going to blow your minds. So hold on to your hats. So if you ask anyone on the street, and certainly anyone at this university, what is it for two things to be comparable? They will tell you it has to be the case that one of the options is better than the other, worse than it, or the two are equally good. That's what it is for two things to be comparable. So there are whole branches of study which define comparability in terms of this space. Right? The pie is filled with better, worse, and equal, and there's no other possibility. So now I want to tell you a story that will help illustrate why this definition, which is embedded in pretty much all of economics, social choice theory, rational choice theory, business studies, legal studies, is a mistake as a definition. So suppose everyone in this room, we're the universe, and we, let's use the, the stairwell here. There are two communities in this universe. Over here are what we will call the trichotomists. And the trichotomists believe that there are three ways two things can be compared. One can be better than the other, worse than it, or equally good. So three relations of comparability. Over here, this community are called the dichotomists. And they think there are two only two ways things can be compared. One thing is better or it's worse than the other. Separating them is a large river. One day, a trichotomist meets a dichotomist while fishing on the river. And the trichotomist says to the dichotomist, hey, you know, that fish you, you caught, that's as good as the fish 
I caught. And the dichotomous says, what? What is this as good as? If your fish isn't better than mine, and if it's not worse, then our fish are incomparable. What's important about the story is how we can hear it. Right? One way we can hear it as, as two stipulated understandings passing in the night. Right? By comparable, those trichotomous just mean better, worse, or equal. And the dichotomous just mean better or worse. But interestingly and importantly, we can hear it in a much deeper way. We can hear the story as one in which the dichotomous have made a mistake. They have failed to see that there is this third basic way things can be related. They can be equally good. So when we think about comparability and incomparability, we should not build into the definition of those notions a substantive thesis, which is that things, if they are comparable, must be better, worse, or equal. That's something we have to fight for. We have to roll up our sleeves and establish what are all the different ways in which things can be compared. So we might think the space of comparability is given by better than and worse than. We might think it's given as the trichotomous thinks, but we also might, keeping an open mind, allow that there are more than three ways that things can be fundamentally compared. There could be some fourth way. Who knows? So instead of defining incomparability as the failure of better, worse, and equal to hold, we should define it more capaciously as the failure of any basic fundamental relation to hold between two items, leaving the possibility that there may be a fourth relation, and say that incomparability holds when none of the basic relations holds. A simpler, perhaps more intuitive way to put the point is in terms of a distinction between positive and negative facts. So if we ask God or Buddha to describe what is in this room, God or Buddha is not going to say, there are no flying pink elephants in this room. And that's because the claim that there are no flying pink elephants in this room is a negative fact. It doesn't describe what there is in the room. In the room. It only tells us what's not in the room. Similarly, when we say one thing is better than the other, we're describing positively how they relate. If we say one thing is not better than the other, we don't know how they relate. So incomparability should be understood as there being no positive fact about how the options relate. Okay, so why should we think that the hard choice you all have in your minds isn't hard because the alternatives are incomparable? Well, here's a, a kind of philosopher's reason for thinking that incomparability doesn't explain hard choices. So notice we want there to be an isomorphism, a kind of matching between the way your alternatives relate and what you should do in the face of those alternatives. So if one option is better than the other, then that's clearly what you should choose. If it's worse, then don't choose that. If they're equally good, then what should you do? Well, you can flip a coin, just arbitrarily choose. So what should you do if your alternatives are incomparable? Again, you should arbitrarily choose, but you're not flipping a coin or picking, as in the case when two things are equally good. Because when two things are equally good, rationality has told you, has given you permission, has said, look, the two things are equally good, so go ahead, flip a coin between them. But if two things are incomparable, rationality has not given you permission. Rationality has been silent. It doesn't say you can do, you can flip a coin. It just says nothing. And you can arbitrarily choose among two incomparables, but the arbitrary selection is not selection with the permission of rationality. 
any philosophy students in the audience will recognize incomparability as holding if existentialism is true. Um, okay, but with respect to your hard choices, why should we think that your alternatives are not incomparable? Well, because incomparability takes you outside of the realm of rational choice. You're no longer exercising your rational agency. So you have two alternatives, and if they're incomparable, you must exercise not your rational agency, but some other kind of agency. Suppose you're climbing on a mountain, and your foot slips, and your hand shoots out. That's an exercise of animal agency, not rational agency. And incomparability takes our hard choices outside the exercise of our rational agency, but that's clearly a mistake. Our hard choices involve choices between careers, whether to marry, how many children to have. These are all hard choices within the context of an exercise of our lives as rational agents. So as a quick recap, we know we don't like ignorance, we don't like incommensurability, we don't like incomparability as explanations for why our hard choices are hard. So what should we say instead? Well, here's what I suggest. We should say that hard choices are hard because our, our alternatives are on a par. So what is it for two things to be on a par? Well, here's a gloss, not a definition. Two things are on a par when they're comparable, right? They can be compared, but one's not better, it's not worse, they're not equally good. They stand in some fourth basic relation of comparison. That must seem weird. It should seem weird to you. How could there possibly be a fourth way in which things can relate? I think of Lady Justice. Right? The scales either go up, they go down, or they're evenly balanced. How can there be a fourth basic way two things can relate? Well, here's a diagnosis of our puzzlement. When we crawl out of the muck or you know, are created in some way, we struggle to tame the world around us. We utmost care about our own survival. And then we notice we can tame the external world with this wonderful thing called number. And once we use number to measure the world around us, we can build bridges and houses and grow food and survive. And it's this use of number that we use to measure things like length, height, weight, which has been very successful. So the structure of the external, non-evaluative world around us can be measured by number. But why should we think that that same structure applies not to the non-evaluative world, but to the evaluative world, the world of how we should live. Why should number be able to measure values like knowledge, beauty, and love? We have unreflectively taken the structure that holds in the non-evaluative world and slid it right over to thinking about how we should live. So let me say a little bit more about parity, so you can try to get an intuitive grasp. Go back to Anna, who's deciding between staying in her current job, where she gets intellectual satisfaction, and moving to a new job where she will achieve financial security. If her two options are on a par, then what we can say is that they are overall in the same neighborhood of value, while at the same time being qualitatively very different in value. If you reflect on the hard choice I asked you to think about at the beginning of this talk, you will note that the options have these features. Overall, they're in the same neighborhood of value, but they're qualitatively very different. One involves getting financial security, the other involves having intellectual satisfaction. Those are qualitatively very different values. 
and yet they are overall in the same neighborhood of value. But don't conclude that because they're in the same overall neighborhood of value, oh, they must be equally good. If they're equally good, then we know from before that if you make a small improvement in one of them, you've made your hard choice into an easy one. Just add a dollar to one of your options, and now that option will be better. But that's not how it is in hard choices. So being on a par is not the same as being equally good. Moreover, if your options are equally good, it doesn't matter which you choose. You can just flip a coin. But in hard choices, it matters a great deal which you choose. The values at stake, remember, are qualitatively very different. So our conclusion to the first question, what makes a choice hard, is the fact that your alternatives are on a par. But now you can say, well, thanks a lot, Chang. How does that help me? What am I supposed to do in the face of a hard choice? So let's go back to our chart that's supposed to tell us what to do depending on how the alternatives relate. Well, we know if A is better than B, we should choose it. If A is worse, we should choose the other thing. If they're equally good, we're still you know, wearing our hats of rationality. We're rational agents. And we should go ahead and pick. We flip a coin between them. If they can't be compared, we know we've been dragged out of the realm of rational agency and we have to be exercising some other kind of maybe existential agency when we arbitrarily select. But we think that's not going on in hard choices. We've said, oh, well, what's going on is A and B are on a par. But what should we do? What, what is there left? So we're now moving to the second question. We're almost done. The second question is, what should you do in the face of parity in hard choices? And to answer this question, we're going to have to do a little philosophy. I promise you it won't be too painful. We want to make a distinction between two kinds of reasons. Suppose you go to the doctor, and the doctor draws some blood and tells you that your cholesterol is at 200. We might say you have a reason to exercise. Now we ask, where does that reason come from? Here's this inert fact. Your cholesterol is 200. How can that fact be a reason? How can it have action guiding force? How can it get you up off the couch? How can it be the kind of thing that justifies you're going to the gym? Well, there are two standard explanations for how facts can be reasons for you to do things. One explanation is that it's good, right? it's just a fact that it's good for you to exercise when your cholesterol is at 200. It's just a fact in the world about what's good. The second explanation goes through your desires. You want to live a long and healthy life. And it's because you want that, that the fact that your cholesterol is 200 is a reason for you to start to exercise. Now notice that both of those explanations are what I call given reasons. They're given to you by the way the world is, where the world includes states of your desire. If you think about all the reasons that you had today, most of them will be given to you by the way the world is. So if there were a tiger outside of the door, right, the fact that there's a tiger outside of the door is given to us as a reason to run away and hide. But there's another kind of reason, a reason that's not given to us by the way the world is, but rather reasons that are located within us, within our wills. These are reasons we create through an act of will. So there are these two kinds of reasons, given reasons, which are given to us, and will-based reasons, which we create. But what are will-based reasons? Here's an example of a will-based reason that most people in this room, I think, probably have. How many people here are in committed relationships? Those people who are in committed relationships, I have some news for you. It's not true that the person you are currently with is the best person for you. 
That's because for everyone, it's not true that with respect to whatever makes a life of a, of a couple best, there is only one best person for you. There are many people who are on a par with respect to being a good life partner. At the same time, it's true for those of you who are in good marriages that your significant other, your spouse, is the best for you. How can that be? It's because you have created for yourself a will-based reason to, that makes that person best for you. How did you do that? Well, through the simple activity of commitment. Now, commitment isn't the simple idea of standing up in front of a priest or going to some official office and promising to love and cherish till death do you part. Promises are not commitments in the sense I have in mind. I might promise to wash your car tomorrow, and I'm now obligated to wash your car tomorrow, but I have not put myself, my very agency, behind washing your car tomorrow. In a committed relationship, the commitment is not simply a list of promises. I promise to take out the garbage on Wednesdays. I promise to you know, send our kids to a nice college. A commitment has to do with an internal activity of seeing things as reasons for you that might not have been reasons before. Suppose you are dating Bob and you've been on 12 dates with Bob, and he invites you over to his apartment, and you see some dirty socks lying on the floor. When you're not in a committed relationship, you see the socks as, he's a slob, he's dirty, I don't like it. But if you were married to Bob and in a committed relationship with him, when you see his socks lying on the floor, you see them as providing you with a reason. And the reason might be to yell at him to pick up his socks or to pick them up or to, right? But you see the world differently when you are committed in a relationship. The landscape of the reasons you have changes because of your internal orientation towards the world. That's very different from merely promising someone Right, to pick up their laundry, say. So let's put this all together and go back to Anna, who's deciding between the two jobs. She faces a hard choice because she's got two alternatives that are in the same overall neighborhood of value, but are qualitatively very different. Her options are on a par. But her options are on a par with respect to her given reasons, the reasons given to her by the world the salary, the intellectual satisfaction. So as far as the world goes, her options are on a par. Now Anna has the normative power to commit to one of the options and create for herself a new will-based reason she didn't have before, a reason based in her own commitment to pursue one option over the other. So Anna might commit to having financial security and create a new reason for her to change jobs instead of stay in her job. Whereas you, faced with a similar circumstance, might commit to the intellectual satisfaction and create for yourself a will-based reason to stay in your current job. We can create reasons only for ourselves. So when Anna commits to making more money, for financial security so she can start her family, say. She creates for herself a new will-based reason she didn't have before, and now, taking into account all the reasons she has, she has most reason to take the new job. Right? The options are no longer on a par. She has most reason to choose one option over the other. 
And in this way, she makes it true of herself that she is the sort of person who has most reason to go for financial security over intellectual satisfaction. Now, for those of you who think commitment is just some kind of airy-fairy philosopher's notion, there is a possible neural basis for what I'm calling inter internal commitment. So actually, a different part of the brain is activated when people have to choose between options that are not externally determined. Now, the important point about commitment is that it's through commitment that we shape our own identities. So how does that work? Well, if you look at all the reasons given to you by the world, many of those reasons will leave you with hard choices. That is, your alternatives will be on a par. But you have the normative power to create for yourself a new will-based reason right, to stand behind one of the values of the alternatives, like financial security, and make it true of you that you have most reason to change jobs rather than to stay. Now notice everything I've said about hard choices is purely structural. I haven't relied on any substantive features of hard choices. And so if this analysis of hard choices is right, it applies not only in to hard choices in our individual lives, but also for institutions. So within our individual lives, from the most trivial choices we make between toaster ovens to the most important, like how to spend our lives, and across the most important institutions, hard choices, I think, should be understood as cases where alternatives are on a par and there is a normative power of the decision maker to create a will-based reason that favors one alternative over the other. So I'm going to end the talk with a hard choice that every one of us faces. How should you wear your hair? So it's true of everyone, probably not everyone, but most of us in this room, that there is not one best hairdo for each of us. There are many hairstyles that are on a par. So you might wear your hair in a two-tone ombre style to show your iconoclasm. Or you might wear it in a style that harkens back to the 50s, to a time that you may prefer to the present. Or you may wear your hair very short because you're lazy. So what am I saying? I'm saying you're supposed to commit to one hairstyle and thereby make it best for you? No. And that's because when you are faced with a hard choice, there are two rational things you can do. What I've emphasized is the normative power you have to create a reason for yourself and make it true that you have most reason to pursue one option as opposed to another. But there's something else you can do that's perfectly rational, and that is drift. Drifting is intentionally choosing something. So, you know, my husband drifts into his haircuts. It's whatever Supercuts is offering for $8. Uh, and most people in this room, not to be offensive, look like they're a bit of drifters in the hairdo department. But what's important is that we all commit to various things. And what we commit to creates our identities. These people in this room probably drifted into their hair styles. But if we were in a room of fashion models, those are people who probably committed to their hairstyles. So the reasons we create for ourselves then create our identities. Right? The identity of a fashion model is very different from the identity of an academic. And that's because the, in the hard choices they face, academics commit to certain things and fashion models commit to different things. So what you commit to and what you drift into create your rational identity. So now we go back to our chart and we can fill in the blank. We have a full theory of what we should do depending on how the alternatives relate. If A is better than B, choose A. 
if A and B are equally good, pick wearing your hat of rationality. If A and B are incomparable, plump, that's arbitrarily choosing, but not wearing your hat of rationality. And in hard choices, when your alternatives are on a par, you can commit or you can drift. Either is okay, and whatever you end up doing will help create your rational identity. So now we end with where we began, which is how to be a rational agent. Remember the template view told us, here's our job as rational agents. Go out into the world, discover the given reasons we have, and then respond to them appropriately. But notice that our given reasons run out. That's what hard choices are. So the template view leaves us stuck in hard choices. Moreover, the template view enslaves us to our reasons. Why is that? Because remember the chart. If there are just given reasons, then when A is better than B, that's what you must do. You must choose A. If A is worse, you must choose B. If A and B are equally good, here's what you must do. You must flip a coin. There's no room for us in the template view. What we must do is understand that our job as rational agents is not simply to go out into the world and discover the reasons there are and then dutifully, like an automaton, respond to them. Instead, we also have this normative power to create reasons for ourselves and become the authors of our own lives in hard choices. So the moral of the story is to try to shake off what we've all been brainwashed into believing, which is what we must do is figure out the reasons we have, and that is our job, just to figure out those reasons. Instead, we must embrace the hard choices we face and think of them as opportunities for us to commit to things and create reasons for ourselves, thereby fashioning our unique identities. Thank you.